Well, Amanda, thank you so much for being part of this conversation series. The future is calling us to greatness. Thanks for having me. Well, I must confess that until last week when I was uh, researching Paul Hawken for my interview with him and learned about Project Drawdown, I was unfamiliar with you and your work. And since then, I've watched your TED Talk, your TEDx Talk, and I uh, have been all over your site and just was terribly excited to invite you to this. And uh, so one of the things I've been doing at the start is just asking all my guests to help us get who you are, like introduce yourself, don't be bashful, help mm -hmm. us un understand both sort of how you got to be where you are, but also what you're best known for and what you're proudest of in terms of, you know, your own commitments. Excellent. Thank you. So I guess I will start at the beginning. Uh, my parents are anthropologists and I was uh, lucky enough to grow up around the world with them. And um, they, they call people like me a third culture kids. Um, so I have kind of my first culture, which is my parents' culture, um, my passport country, these second cultures in which I, I grew up. And then when I return to my first culture, uh, it's as though I could see it as a third culture. So I can see um, from an outside perspective. And, um, you know, we've been studied through culture kids and we're kind of more open minded, out of the box thinkers. Uh huh. Um, and that's a, it's a big part of my identity. And um, another big part of my identity is uh, Buckminster Fuller. So I, um, I learned about him when I was uh, attending Presidio Graduate School as a student um, uh -huh. and I teach there. And uh, actually, you'll see his map behind me. Yes, I do. Um, and his influence has just um, really made me align with uh, putting 100% of humanity first. Um, and really looking at how can we make the world work for 100% of humanity in the shortest possible time through spontaneous collaboration without ecological offense or disadvantage to anyone. And that was kind of his mission for his world game, and I've adopted that as my own life's mission. That's great. Um, and so a background in international development and combined with that has really led me to focus um, very uh, singularly on climate change and how you know the world can uh, use climate change as this rallying cry to uh, transform a lot of our systems. Uh -huh. um, but we can get into that a little later. Sure. Um, yeah, so I went to Presidio Graduate School and, uh, and now teach there, and I'm living in the Bay Area here in San Francisco, and I co-founded a new nonprofit with Paul Hawken um, called Project Drawdown, and I'm the executive director of that. Um, and also involved in all sorts of other fun side projects. Well, yeah, I, I'll actually want to hear a little bit about your side projects because I know the hero hatchery sounded fascinating, and I understand you and your husband uh, uh, co-founded and and uh, and do that. But uh, but yeah, so let's start with. I'd love to hear more because really. Um, uh, David McConville, who I understand you just had lunch with the other day, is one of my dear friends and colleagues, um, of course, is the um, I think he's chair of the board of the Buckminster Fuller Institute. And he often will use that quote. So to hear that that's a that's a sense of mission, a, mi a mission statement for yourself is, is very exciting. So say a little bit more about sort of how Bucky has inspired you and and influenced uh, the work that you're now doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so Bucky called for what he um what he coined as the design science revolution. Um, and it's uh, kind of a, a particular way of looking at sustainability um, that's really about designing the right parameters around um, humanity so that spontaneous cooperation or collaboration can happen. Um, and I really love that idea that you can um, kind of create the conditions for people to be able to kind of see for themselves and be able to uh, spontaneously kind of join this movement and see uh, what the future uh, can hold and, and be, um, be more hopeful. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that design piece. Um, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say actually that we, I really haven't had a major spokesperson on that. I, I would have loved to have had Bill McDonough as part of this series and, um, but he was just too busy and, um, designing our structures, designing our systems, designing our economics, designing governance 
such mm-hmm. that it we that our that our natures that our instincts move us in the right direction so that the cheaper easier more convenient thing to do is the right thing to do right. um integrating true cost there's so many aspects of the design issue that when things are designed poorly good people become dangerous and and great people can engage in great evil because the systems that they're a part of are designed in ways that yeah. make it effortless to move down that that direction so say a little bit more please uh about uh both bucky's sense of that and and also what um you know so what, what your work now is is leading uh in that direction mm-hmm. yeah um bucky's kind of art uh was called comprehensive anticipatory design science um so it's, it's really incorporating the comprehensiveness of you know systems thinking which is very prevalent in this movement uh and anticipatory thinking so you know thinking ahead um and then the blending of design science i think is really interesting so looking um you know design thinking and uh, a couple of these kind of more design centers uh design centered frameworks have been becoming more popular um, and then the science piece, I think, is is um, not being translated as well. So that's a big part of what we're doing at Project Drawdown is taking the academia, um, you know, literature and, and all the great science that's being done around climate and specifically around the solutions and translating that into something that the general public can um, can understand and get excited about. So we're looking at a hundred different climate solutions um, and looking across a diverse spectrum, not only just the technological solutions of energy and energy efficiency, but also looking at the um, ecological solutions. So a lot of um, forestry practices and biochar and um, some other really fun um, sequestration practices. And then finally also looking at social solutions. So we're looking at all of these climate solutions and all of the best academia uh, all the best academia has to offer around them mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. translating them into uh, this book, a uh, database, and a digital platform where people can go on and see what the impact will be of each of these solutions over the next 30 years. And the goal is to see how quickly we can achieve drawdown, which is the point at which greenhouse gases uh, peak and then start to come back down again. Yeah. So the concentrations will peak somewhere around hopefully – not too much higher than 450 and then and then start to come back down again. And that's a new story. Not a lot of people are saying that within the climate movement. And I think it gives people an uh, incredible sense of, of uh, possibility and relief to know that it's not it's not the stabilization at 450 or 500 parts per million, which is not a stable world. And right. we're already not right. stable exactly. at 400. Um, but to have this goal of drawdown um, and and really bringing that that science piece in. Okay, and I and uh, I'll uh, for for those of you who are watching or listening to this, we've got some a bandwidth issue. So uh, when Amanda is speaking, I'll be turning my video off. Uh, and then coming back on when I ask a question, but uh, we may end up dropping a few times, and I sincerely apologize for that. Okay. Please continue. Okay, great. So I was saying that uh, Project Drawdown is uh, really about translating the the best in climate science, specifically around the solutions, mm-hmm. to a uh, more general public. Um, there's some really exciting reports that are being done about what is already happening um, in what we call the... the um, the three R's of climate change solutions. So we have to replace our current energy infrastructure. We have to reduce the amount of energy and throughput, you know, material yeah. resources yeah. going through society. And then we have to restore, uh, restore soil carbon and biomass carbon. Um, so those are the three R's that we're looking at. And um, we're, we're taking each of those solutions and looking at the best available information we have have on their what we call an impact analysis over the next 30 years. So financially, uh, ecologically, in terms of climate change and, and otherwise, uh, and socially, what is the impact of all these solutions? And we're painting this picture of kind of what's already happening, um, you know, the solutions that we already have available. Um, and if they're scaled as fast as we know how to do it in the next 30 years, um, how fast can we achieve drawdown? Yeah. And, uh, Drawdown is this point at which greenhouse gases peak and then begin to uh, decline. Um, and then temperatures will soon follow. And it's possible that within my lifetime, temperatures will come down again. We don't know. We haven't run the full numbers yet. Sure. Uh, 
but that's a that's a great news story uh, and it gives me a lot of hope and just to know that yes things will get worse and the climate is going to continue to become uh, unstable in the coming decades but knowing that it, it can stabilize again and really come down um, to safe levels again just gives me so much more uh, peace when thinking about the future. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, my my experience, uh, just reading your site, I was on for about an hour and a half, just read everything, all the pages, and um, and then in talking with Paul, and there, frankly, there, I told Connie when I got off the po- phone with Paul that this is the single most exciting thing happening on the planet, in my opinion, um, mm-hmm. and there's lots of good stuff happening. So could you say a little bit more, t- take each of the three R's and just mm-hmm. talk a little bit about that, and, um, you know, uh, yeah, let's start there. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so replace, that's kind of the, the typical climate solutions you hear about, very important, um, solar and wind, uh, geothermal, you know, just moving away from fossil fuels to, uh, to renewable energies and biomass energy as well. Um, so that's kind of uh, a little, you know, has a lot of airtime already. People understand that. Sure. Reducing, um, you have the efficiency measures that people hear about a lot too, Um, But there's also a reduction in material throughput through society where we're including um, sharing economy within there um, and really changing people's behaviors. And then also looking at population, uh, curbing population growth and boosting uh, reproductive rights for women. So Uh we're looking at three solutions that do that. Uh, Girls' education, family planning, and uh, improved access to child health care. Yeah, I, I, what, what, one of my one of my guests, uh, I forget who it was, but it might have been Lier Keith, said that the most important thing that you can do to reduce population is to treat, teach girls to read. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's an incredible trim tab. Speaking of Buckminster Fuller, uh, girls' education is an incredible t- trim tab, and it's one of the solutions. I mean, we're we're studying how all of these solutions uh, actually offer these cascading um, uh, beneficial impacts. You know, so they have secondary and tertiary um, uh, benefits that come along. So girls' education, you know, boosts reproductive rights and, you know, curbs population. But it also, for every single year of primary school that a girl has, her eventual wages are boosted by 15 to 20 percent. Wow. And there's just incredible benefits like that. Um, clean cook stoves is one is another reduction. Mm-hmm could also be seen as replacement of, of dirty fuel, but uh, causes black carbon, which is a, has a immediate warming effects on the world, but also that black carbon for everyone who's inside um, breathing over a three stone fire. It's like smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. That's how oh, much wow. soot you're putting into your lungs. And there's 2 billion people around the world right now who are cooking over what they call three stone fires. Um, wow. So as we change over to clean cook stoves, you're preventing these like, mostly children and women who are in the kitchen from the equivalent of two packs of cigarettes a day. And pneumonia is the number one leading cause of death for children around the world. Wow. So you can solve climate change and then also improve the health of, of children. And, and um, there's all these sorts of benefits like that from each of the solutions we're looking at. So we like to say that climate change is a transformation that transforms everything. You know, it's, it's kind of this rallying cry and yeah. we, we have only a couple decades to really figure it out here, but in the process, we can figure out so many of the other things that are going uh, awry. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, the, the phrase that climate change is uh, the the thing that changes everything. It reminds me of a book I just read, Naomi Klein's new book, "This Changes mm-hmm. Everything," yeah. and she makes that same point. Now, what yeah. was the third R? The third is restore, and that's um, kind of my my pet favorite. I have been really interested in biochar. Um, and involved in that. For, uh, for people who aren't familiar with biochar, tell us about that. Mm-hmm, yeah. So biochar is essentially a charcoal that you put in your soil uh, and it boosts your crop productivity and reduces the need for water um, and is essentially pure carbon. So it's a, a really effective way of putting carbon uh, out of the atmosphere and into the soil where it can be productive. Yeah. Uh, essentially, it's like a, a small sponge for uh-huh soil so uh, a gram of carbon like the size of my uh, tip of my pinky here can have up to 3,000 square feet of surface area and as you know soil soil is best when it's alive and it's thriving um, and all the you know little microorganisms and stuff uh, really appreciate that biochar and live in it Um, so we're looking at biochar and a couple other solutions Um, we have about 12 now within the restore 
realm. And that's really where we can actually bring down the carbon. You know, everything else is reducing and kind of getting to, um, you know, a, a, a stable level. But sure. Restore is really the only place where we know how to reduce from the atmosphere and, and come back down to safe levels. And and I I don't seem I don't remember seeing there much emphasis on sort of the more high tech global uh, what is it called Glo- uh, geoengineering kinds of things uh, and I was grateful for that. Mm-hmm. Um, say say a little bit more about some of the you know how do we build soil how do we take carbon. Uh, and bring it uh, into the soil, you know, obviously planting trees, a moratorium on, on cutting trees or something like that. I don't know if that's your solution, but that would be something that immediately comes to mind is value the parts of nature that already do that and promote that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty simple. It's, you know, the atmosphere has too much carbon. If you're looking at stocks and flows, mm-hmm. the atmosphere has too much carbon and the biomass layer and soil carbon layer have been losing carbon. So it's okay letting photosynthesis work and bring that, bringing that carbon down into the biomass layer. And then somehow kind of pressing pause on that carbon cycle and yep. keeping that biomass either, or the carbon either in that biomass or soil layer. Um, and we're looking at all sorts of avoided deforestation practices um, and afforestation and um, all kinds of kind of carbon farming practices, uh-huh. um, including biochar and no-till farming and perennial farming. Um, and rotational grazing that's a really mm-hmm. yeah fun. yeah i mean one of the books that we just listened to just maybe two weeks ago uh was uh, the the soil will save us i think and uh i was there was many times there were many times throughout that book that i thought wow i didn't know that you know? yeah 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 it's really fun stuff to learn because right now we're kind of operating in this uh old paradigm of dirt is inert and that we can just add this npk oh, fertilizer yeah. to the plants and it's you know we're losing our our soil carbon at alarming rates yes um and i think once we transfer over to oh my gosh soil is alive and can thrive uh and you know can uh be the source of all life as it is um and if we really like respect it and and farm in a different way we can um, bring down the carbon from the atmosphere but then also you know create healthier farms and healthier communities in the process yeah amen well one of the things i i often speak to religious audiences i've spoken to some 2000 groups over the last 12 years and uh when i speak in churches one of the things i'll often say is that our relationship to the soil is our relationship to god the idea that we can have some kind of a uh, personal or healthy relationship to God as a supreme being outside the universe and not have a healthy relationship to the soil should be considered blasphemy as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. So, well, say a little bit more about, you mentioned financial, ecological, and uh, social uh, approaches. Say a little bit more about each of those, if you would. Mm-hmm. Those are, uh, that's actually the impact that we're looking at each of them. Um, but we are looking, I think you might be referring to this, the social technological and the ecological. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so the technological, like I said, are, are kind of the energy solutions sure. um, and then the social, um, looking at just different ways we can look at behavior change. So like low carbon diet is a really great, um, uh-huh. solution and, and within all of these solutions, we're not. We're, we're doing something a bit different instead of saying it's just top down and it's something that the utilities can do or just saying like, you know, here's a hundred ways you can save the earth at home. We're really trying to broaden and look at all, all levels of agency, we call it. Um, but basically all the different places where an individual has the choice, mm-hmm. uh, but maybe it's because they're a building manager. And so there's a lot of building solutions or maybe it's because they lobby to their city government. So there's a lot of city solutions like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Look- uh, solutions within individual, community, city, uh, building, business, uh, and land and utility as well. Um, so that that agency, I think, is really important uh, to know that there's this diversity of the solutions out there and that it does come down to the individual, but the individual actually has a lot of choice. Uh, and it's not just over your household. Yeah, You know, people can get involved at, at different levels. That's great. And uh, if you could also say a little bit about just the design of the Project Drawdown book and and website, because I think uh, we were talking earlier about design and how design matters. And I I found the design to be very attractive and very empowering. So say a little bit about that, if you would. Yeah, yeah, that's a a core tenant to what we're doing is 
is really making it approachable and, and beautiful, you know, something that people want to go in and play around with. Um, I think there's been a lot of great work done around climate that's, um, that makes people feel very scared. Mm, and I sure. think it's important. I think it's really crucial that we have that urgency, but I think it's also really nice to have a place where you can feel a little bit playful. So in, in neuroscience, they say that play is actually the only time where uh, uncertainty is rewarded and celebrated. So we're really trying to go for more of this kind of like play. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. And most, I mean, almost every other state, uncertainty is something you do not want. But when right. you're, in, you're in play, you're like, oh, I don't know what's going to yeah. happen. It's not fun. Right. Um, so we're trying to kind of bring that vibe mm -hmm. to the project so people can kind of be in that in that state of more openness and creativity and thinking long term um, while probably still having the urgency um, that a, a lot of other groups are doing very well within the climate space and we're not trying to say that that's not necessary yeah. but that it can be balanced and you know we can work together in order to um, empower people to action yeah I, I often think about it in an embodied sense that different organs are playing different roles in the body of life and all are needed for the health of the body um, and certainly uh, awaking people up uh, with a sense of urgency and a sense of, uh, you know, the timeliness of it uh, is vital. Uh, but for those of us who are awake, so often it, we can slip into despair and depression and overwhelm and just fear, and that doesn't help either. So that's why it's, it seems to me vital to have these positive solution-oriented approaches such as, such as uh, Project Drawdown, and even just the concept of Drawdown, just that, mm -hmm. that meme itself uh, helps people to have a way of holding on to something that, as you said, it provides a sense of hope, it provides a sense that, that there is some way forward. It doesn't mean Pollyanna. It doesn't mean we're going to avoid difficulties and significant difficulties, but mm. that uh, we can look forward to, or at least look forward to the possibility that we can mm. move through this and ultimately humanity can come into a better relationship with the natural world than we currently are in, which obviously yeah. we need. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really important point. Um, as I'm speaking to people, it kind of, you know, it, it shifts you, the way you're thinking about the future. You're like, oh, well, everyone knows it's getting worse. And a lot of people are saying, you know, there's, this is just the new normal climate changed, you know, we're, you know, the extreme weather is just here now. And I think if we all know that it only has to be this way for a couple decades, it, it makes you think about things completely differently. You know, you're like, okay, let's hunker down and let's get through this. And in the process, let's, you know, use this as this transformation that transforms everything and, uh, and really get our act together. And then we can come out the other end and celebrate and, and, you know, be the humanity that we've always wanted to be. Yeah, well, it's certainly an inspiring vision. I mean, I, the, the, we're not going to have any shortage of challenges. I, I've, I've recently read a study that suggested that even if all of humanity were wiped out in the next 48 hours by some virus that uh, just already what's in, in the space in the system that it's likely that the seas will rise for the next thousand years and become, you know, somewhat more acidified than they currently are. So we're going to have certainly no challenges for moving sort of our cities away, from, you know, uh, backing off from, from the oceans. But I think you're right for, for us to be able to see within this century, within possibly our lifetimes, uh, the, the, you know, that we've peaked and we're that every year uh, we're uh, producing less and less emissions and making significant progress. And in a way that's uniting humanity, to cooperate at larger scale than we would have otherwise, then there is some uh, some sense of hope in the face of some real challenges. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the and you know the big difference with our vision and and some of the you know IPCC models or international energy agency models uh, that are out there is really the drawdown uh, act. You know, there's the the kind of the noun of the, the point at which we come back down, but the the verb of drawing down. Yes. Uh, carbon uh, using these what we call the restore um, <clears throat> piece of the three-legged stool that's they have not really been included in a lot yes. of the models to the degree in which we're including them um, and that's possible and what happens when you draw carbon out of the atmosphere is that that carbon is then also drawn back out of the ocean the ocean will kind of equilibrize with the with I the see. atmosphere. I see. And that's pretty much the only way we know how to how to prevent the oceans from yes. um, acidifying is actually by uh, taking it into the ground. Yes. yes. Um, and and we're really excited about that piece of our model because 
it's it's unique. There's no one else really like pushing uh, and saying, you know, this is actually how fast we can we can grow these different technologies, uh, ecological te- technology. Well, we well, know of. I'm an evangelist. That's what I do. I'm, I've been called America's evolutionary evangelist, and uh, I've sort of uh, popularized the sacred side of science. And you can you can bet that I will be evangelizing this drawdown concept in this project. Um, I remember being inspired when I had my interview with uh, Paul um, Paul Gilding, uh, mm-hmm. because the second half of his book, The Great Disruption. Uh, covers what he calls the one degree Celsius war plan that uh, he thinks that we will not be satisfied. We will not be willing to accept merely two degrees that, uh, and of course that there has to be a drawdown component there. Mm -hmm. Well, Amanda, one of the things I was inspired by is sort of shifting topic a little bit, uh, obviously related, is uh, your TEDx talk recently that you gave in Tokyo uh, was on sort of the evolution of business and our th- ways of thinking about business and uh, and that sort of thing. So say a little bit about some of the main points you made in there and, and how that's relevant to this conversation and this theme of the future calling us to greatness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I had a, a really good time preparing for that call, uh, that talk. I'm well, that, that was, uh, yeah, let me interrupt. That was obvious. I mean, that was a well-prepared, I mean, the fact that you were able to talk at such a pace, because I guess you were in Tokyo also, but there was just a slowness. There was no rush. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I delivered two TEDx talks myself, and I know that, I mean, even though I've spoken to thousands of audiences, I was more nervous uh, yeah. at those two TEDx talks than anything else I've ever done. So I thought yeah. you were fabulous. And, and yeah. I reckon anybody watching or listening to this conversation, please take the time to watch Amanda's TEDx talk. Yeah. Okay, Thank continue. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm very inspired by the work of Janine Benyus. Uh, she's actually uh, on our board at Project Drawdown, so I get to work with her now. Um, and um, she's been studying uh, mutualism quite a bit. And so this is kind of a, a different way of looking at, at what I call the nature of nature sure. um, and that it's it's really not as competitive of a world out there as we um, tend to think. It's much more cooperative mm-hmm. and that there are actually these, you know, underground fungal mm-hmm. networks um, that transfer um, – warning signals and water and sugars from plant to plant that are you know not part of the same species and that we're actually discovering that it's a lot more um of a you know that there's this interdependence that fuels life and that um it's not it's not commonly seen you know in in typically even in forestry schools now you study the forest and you're like oh those two trees are competing for sunlight and that's what's going on there and you really actually expose all the you know the mycorrhizal networks underneath you see that it's it's all one ecosystem and i think that that understanding of interdependence um, can be utilized within kind of the the business realm a lot more um, and that if we if we see each other as um, you know allies and, and creating shared value um, <clears throat> that we can um, create what i well janine says we need to life creates the conditions conducive to life mm-hmm. so that's kind of the underlying principle of yes of, uh, of earth here and um <clears throat> And I said, what if commerce could create the conditions conducive to commerce? So if we can make sense yeah, I mean, duh. With P <laughs> and make sense with an S, you know, if we're yes. constantly kind of making both kinds of sense out there uh, and really thinking about the future and, and working in this more cooperative instead of competitive way, mm-hmm. uh, I think it could change everything. Well, yeah, and it gets back to the Bucky's concept of spontaneous cooperation. And also, even though you didn't mention her name, I was, you know, just so grateful that you uh, and Janine, obviously, as well, are furthering the the work of one of my uh, just dear friend, colleagues, mentors, really one of my earliest teachers in this whole realm, uh, which is um, Lynn Margulis, who just died just a few years ago, the the famed uh, microbiologist and uh, her work and really helping us move beyond um, and some of the world isn't yet beyond it, but moved beyond simply that evolution is just all about competition to see that there's such symbiosis and mutualism that's, that's at the heart of, mm-hmm. of evolution. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, like I say in my talk, it's not about the survival of the fittest. It's actually the survival of the fitness within yes. the ecosystem. And that Darwin himself was actually mis, um, misquoted there. Yes, exactly. 
Yeah. Anything else you want to say about that that uh, TEDx talk? Because um, I, I just thought that the, the points that you made there were just fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sure. I'll share um, one of my favorite Buckminster Fuller uh, kind of metaphors, which is um, the way that I look at where humanity is now, which is borrowed by where he looked at it. He said that humanity now is like a chick that is just hatched from its eggshell. So we've used up all of our our oil, mm -hmm. our embryonic fluid, mm -hmm. uh, to get us to this point where we're actually capable of doing anything. Um, and it might seem like the sky is falling, like this is the end because we're just about to crack through and, and go through this great transformation. Um, but we actually have wings and feet and all this capability that we actually haven't even exercised. Mm. Uh, and it's uncomfortable, you know, because we're, we're done with that embryonic fluid and it's not going to be quite as easy to just kind of like suck from uh, this like embryonic sack of fossil fuels that we've been mm -hmm. surrounded by, but that we can be thankful towards those fossil fuels and appreciate that, you know, they've created us into who we are and we can step outside of this eggshell and stand on our own two feet and learn to fly. Yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, the, the power of a metaphor, it's just incredible. One mm -hmm. of the other metaphors that I've uh, gotten a lot of traction with when I speak to audiences is that, you know, we've been, we've been kind of like a cancer within the body of life. That is, we've been consuming the body of life for our benefit. But you know, cancer does that. Uh, but then if, if, if cancer consumes enough of the body, it kills the body, but then it dies. A far more apt metaphor and vision of possibility that is inspiring is humanity becoming like an immune system where we protect and foster and defend the health mm -hmm. and the well-being of the larger body of life upon which we depend and of which we are a part. And that's a world and the only world in which humanity can truly thrive. And that vision, rather than sort of the vision of helping us to do less bad, which is particularly inspiring, uh, the vision of actively participating and becoming like an immune system in the body of life is a vision that, in my experience, young people can get really jazzed about, and they do. Yeah, yeah. I think that participation is is really vital to talk about, too, and it, it happens in the chick metaphor, too. You know, yes. When the chick is out, it can live in this regenerative existence with the rest of the universe and, uh, and nature, and, and then you, you kind of... Uh, prevent people from thinking that human and nature is separate. And yeah. I think that's a big part of what's gotten us into this mess, um, that we are actually all one and it is all you know, interdependent. Yeah, well, my great mentor, Thomas Berry, often talked about that we are the universe becoming conscious of itself and thinking of humanity as separate from above and apart from nature and that the laws of nature and the laws of ecology don't apply to us is, is purely suicidal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is fabulous. So say a little bit more about your, your husband's and your project on the, the hero uh, hatchery. Yeah, the hero hatchery. Um, kind of along those same lines as the chick metaphor. Uh, my husband, Ryan Kushner, and I started the hero hatchery uh, last year. And the idea is to um, make more recognizable figures within the climate movement. Um, you know, we, we went around and we asked you know, hundreds of people, like, when you think about climate change, who do you think of? Mm -hmm. uh, most people said Al Gore, uh, Bill McKibben was a you know, far distant second, and most people didn't even really know. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're thinking back to the civil rights era and you know, how we learned about civil rights uh, when we were in school, and there's all of these great iconic figures that really made it um, you know, palatable and, and, and gave the, the movement some, just uh, a human voice and a, and a way of understanding. And heart kind and soul. Of, yeah. Climate change is so hard to understand. It's so esoteric and it's about the future and it's about everything. And it's just, it's hard for people to actually sink into. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're uh, kind of uplifting some people within the movement um, and really focusing now on um, a price on carbon and, and people who are working uh, specifically on that. So we'll have some really exciting videos coming up and, um, and some new fellows for the new year um, that are working with Citizens Climate Lobby. So we've been a, a partnership with them, which is really exciting. That's fabulous because Citizens Climate Lobby is one is probably is the main thing that I've been evangelizing when I when I get to the place in my program. And my program is also titled "The Future Is Calling Us to Greatness." My main evening program. It's an hour and a half long program, and. Um, when I get to the place of what can I do, what can we do? Uh, I promote Citizens Climate Lobby and I say, if you only remember one thing from my entire presentation, join your local chapter of CCL. And, and I've had people criticize that there are other really important things being done that I, perhaps I shouldn't state it quite that way. But it seems to me that until we marshal the power of the market and help all of us move in the right direction, 
Um, I've often quoted Bob Inglis, a uh, Republican from South Carolina, when he says, you know, I favor a conservative, this is a direct quote from him, I favor a conservative approach that marshals the power of the market and doesn't increase the size of government. Here's it in a nutshell. Yeah. Put all the costs and all the fuels and eliminate all the subsidies and then watch the free enterprise system solve the climate and energy problem. That's and so uh, it just nails it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I really appreciate it. They're only five years old and they have uh, a member in almost every county in the nation. And they've done a really good job. Yeah. So we're really excited to be partnering with them. That's great. Well, Amanda, on this theme of the future is calling us to greatness, you've already mentioned some things, but anything else that you'd like to share in terms of what gives you inspiration to wake up each day in the face of some really scary stuff to do the work that you do? Mm, yeah. I really like the the idea that this is the most exciting time to be alive. Um, and and to know that what we do in the next decade or two will impact the future of life forever. Yes, exactly. Uh, is something that's just so exciting and overwhelming definitely. Yes, exactly. Uh, at times, but uh, that that ability to to see it as exciting and to see that actually we have the biggest team ever on the job, 14% of humanity that's ever existed is alive today um that's an interesting way to think about it yeah and i think you know we have we have the biggest team for the biggest job and um and just that idea that climate change can be this transformation and this 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 rallying cry Mm -hmm. um and address these these issues that have just gone on for centuries um just really really excites me and just see you know we're kind of going through this keyhole as, as other people have said and um and it's just, yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, yeah. Well, I agree. And, and part of it, part of the reason it's exciting, I, I find, is that it's a terrifying time to live. It's a scary time. And yet, you know, this sense that uh, heroes and sheroes are alive today, that future generations will look back and call heroes and sheroes because, you know, heroes are those who not only themselves, but inspire others to be a blessing to the future, to be a, 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 a saving force or, a, you know, a, um, an, a, a, a practical inspiration uh, in ways that are blessing to future generations. And I think that's that's the time we live in. And um, that's why I'm, you know, what I find the work that you're doing, that you and Paul are doing with Project Drawdown and you and your husband are doing as well, um, is inspiring a whole new generation to look to solutions to, yes, Look at this. Look at the bad news. Look at it squarely. Don't deny it, but ultimately allow that to motivate you to be solution oriented and heroic oriented. Um, that this is this is a time when we get to do great things, and uh, it's all about not just attending to our own wealth, our own comfort, our own pleasures, uh, but really finding ways to do what it takes, including, you know living more simply, including building soil, including all the practical things that your book and, and project is about um, mm-hmm. at whatever scale, whatever, wherever we are uh, in terms of our own influence. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. And there's lots of ways to get involved with Project Drawdown. A big part of what we're doing is just building a giant coalition. Um, so we have hundreds of partners and advisors and um and volunteers working with us and we actually just launched a fellowship program so uh, for people who are interested in kind of going deeper with that climate and financial analysis that we're doing Uh uh, we're starting that fellowship program in january and i'd love to have uh, people apply and and, and come and be part of our team so say a little bit more about that i mean if anybody watching this or listening to this uh, uh, you know that either just inspired by this conversation or then they go onto your website and they get super inspired in addition to this um how do they you know what would you advise or you know suggest for them next steps yeah yeah so anyone can volunteer with us uh, and help us with the research we're doing you know a lot of research on a hundred different solutions and and need as many eyes and ears on the ground kind of uncovering the best available Mm -hmm. information on all these solutions and then this fellowship programmer is for people either kind of leaders and practitioners in the field of these different uh, solutions but also people kind of from uh, academia who can really do the the more thorough analysis yep. um, and we're opening it up uh, in January applications are now open but it'll be starting in January on a rolling basis um, and you know this this book is really co-created it's co-authored um, and it will be not just a book but this database um, that we're giving away to the community so everything that we uh, discover with this research we're going to be giving out uh, in kind of this 
uh, open source database where people can go in and, and help us actually make it better. That's um, and people can build things off of it. Curriculum or investment tools or employee engagement platforms or you know community campaigns or policy or uh, the list goes on and on, art. Um, so we're really excited to kind of co-create it and then also just co-use it and distribute it afterwards once it's done uh, next fall uh, prior to the Paris talks um, for, for the UN. So we really hope to infuse this idea of not only are there solutions, but they're being done, you know, and it's not yeah. like a if we can do it. It's like here it is. It's happening. You know, so many of the projections of, you know, LEDs and solars have just, you know, been totally wrong and we've been doing better than we ever imagined we could. Yeah, that's great. Fabulous. Well, Amanda, this is fabulous. There's one last question that uh, I want to ask, uh, and it's sort of off the wall, but it's I've had so much fun asking everybody this question and never letting anybody know ahead of time what it is. And that is, if you had the opportunity to have dinner with any three people in human history, or so it's all three of them and you, or, or and you and your husband, um, or a one-on-one -on -one where, you know, you go for a hike or over a glass of wine or a beer or, you know, just a cup of coffee or whatever, any three people in history, who would those three people be and why would you choose them? I think there's an obvious answer. <laughs> um, I would love to go on a hike with Buckminster Fuller. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And really just kind of see through his eyes um, what's happening now. I think he, he saw a lot of what was happening now um, ahead of time. You know, he was tracking the, you know, all these exponential growth curves that were on. He was tracking them in 1950 when yes. they were still here. Um, and, uh, yeah, I would just love to hear his perspective, uh, of what's, what's going on now and what's needed. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, he's a very bold man. Um, and I, I get a lot of my energy of, of being a bold woman from him. Mm -hmm. um, I would just love to be able to tap into that in, in person. All right. Who are the other two? Uh, the other two, uh, Nelson Mandela. I love his compassion. Okay. Um, and his ability to forgive. Mm -hmm. uh, and the third, hmm. I'm not sure. What the third be? Hmm. It could actually be somebody still alive too. Still alive, yeah. Hmm. I'll go with Rachel Carson, also because of her boldness. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Great. Well, um, all three of those were actually selected by a number of others, too. So uh, clearly, maybe we should have a larger dinner party. Yeah. <laughs> well, Amanda, this has been fabulous. Any any last things that you'd like to say on this whole theme that the past is rooting for us and the future is calling us to greatness? And then uh, where other than Project Drawdown or, or give us the web, the actual web address and then any any other resources that you would recommend? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I'd just like to say that. Um, Things are a lot better than they may seem. Um, you know, you you have trend lines and headlines, and right now there's there's trend lines of a lot of really great things happening, um, and and but you hear these horrible headlines still, and so I uh, uh, invite people to really look at uh, the more hopeful and and exciting things that are happening and root themselves in that in that possibility. Um, and you can find out more about joining the coalition at drawdown.org. Um, and also join us at herohatchery.org to learn more about that. Um, and for those people looking for <clears throat> further education in this, Presidio Graduate School has some of the best curriculum uh, in the country. We have a couple different certificate programs that you can do if you don't feel like you have the, the full bandwidth to do an MBA. But um, I definitely encourage people to, to look into that as well. That's great. Fabulous. Well, Amanda, blessings on your work and your husband's work at, at every level. And uh, thank you for taking the time to be with us. And um, I'm sure we will be in communication again. Excellent. Thanks so much for having me. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.